Hello everybody. Today we'll be looking at canons as a compositional technique. We'll be looking in particular at their history and application in composition. So without further ado, grab a coffee and let's begin. Generally speaking, a canon is a compositional technique which focuses on imitation and patterns. As a dictionary definition, the word means rule or especially a body of rules or principles generally established as valid and fundamental in a field or art or philosophy. And in music, the term canon is applied to the sort of counterpoint in which rule is most strictly followed. It is a rule that the voice, that's any melodic instrumental part, that begins the canonic passage shall be closely imitated in some way by some other voice or part. If the canon is in more than two voices or parts, then the imitation is manifold. Necessarily such writing as this makes great demands on the technical skill of the writer and the composition of canon may be regarded as the most difficult practice in composition. The canon dates back to pre-baroque times and the most common type of canon is the perpetual canon or infinite canon. This is also known as a catch or a round. As an example, three blind mice, part of a choir or one person could start singing three blind mice and then someone else can come in three blind mice, at a certain point and it, and it can keep going infinitely. These canons are described as perpetual or infinite because once each individual part reaches an end, the next one begins and so on. I wonder if I can try and demonstrate it. Three blind mice, three blind mice, three See blind mice. I don't know. There is a well-known hymn tune called Callis's Canon. In this hymn, the tenor exactly follows the treble at a distance of four beats. Now, this happens to be a canon in the octave below. However, canons can exist in the intervals of a fifth and a fourth above or below, and these are actually quite common. Canon necessarily occurs in the stretto of a fugue. That is, if the stretto is a true one. What I mean by that is, if each voice entering with the subject continues with it after the next voice enters. There are also a number of related terms for canon. I recommend reading canon in the Harvard Dictionary of Music. I have some further details on the slide here if that helps. Traditional canonic techniques. There are a number of different features to canonic writing. These involve Canons that are in unison and interval based. For example, those where the voices imitate the initial subject. They can imitate this at an octave apart, such as in Talis's canon, as I've already mentioned. They can also imitate the fifth or the second and so on. You also get canons that incorporate a number of different voices. For example, a canon for two voices is called a canon two in one, meaning that there is only one melody sufficing for two voices. And so too, we have a canon three in one, four in one and so on. Now you can get four in two. Sometimes two canons are carried on simultaneously. For example, you might have the soprano and alto in one canon, alto and bass in another canon. Such canons are called four in two, as I've already said. Now we have some other terms. These terms are retrograde, inversion, retrograde, inversion. So some canons use techniques that involve retrograde and inversion and retrograde inversion. Using words like retrograde and inversion implies what? Tone row, doesn't it? Which is supposed to be a relatively modern thing. It's not that modern anymore, but you know what I mean. But can you believe it? These techniques were being used in the medieval times. They were just used under the guise of canon instead of tone row. Other types of canon. There are other types of canon apart from the perpetual canon. These include retrograde canon or crab canon or can crisan. The retrograde canon or canon can crisan, also known as the carab, also known as the crab canon, is a more artificial form of canon. It is a canon in which one voice imitates the initial subject in retrograde. Usually both parts begin at the same time and in doing so they depart from the usual idea of staggering the parts in a perpetual canon. So in a perpetual canon one voice will go first and then this will be imitated but in a crab canon both parts start at the same time one is in retrograde one is imitating one part in retrograde. Are well, they both right? Depends. I mean who's going to say which one's the right way around? Inversion canon. 
there also exists canon by inversion. An inversion canon is where any upward interval becomes downward in the subsequent voice part and vice versa, logically speaking. Now, inverted imitation can be an exact one, real inversion, or a tonal inversion. I have an example. Here is an example of a tonal inversion. As you can see, the inverse has been modified so that it remains in G major. Note the F sharp. Think about it, a real, real inversion would result in an F natural here. So a tonal inversion is where intervals are still being inverted but it's being kept within a tonal centre or a tonal key. As such, canons don't have to be strict. They can be freer so as to accommodate different keys. So we can say that a canon is strict or free according to the intervals and whether or not they are exactly imitated. There's also a thing called a table canon. Now this is really fun. The score has been carefully written so that it can be performed from both sides of a table simultaneously. A table canon is a combination of retrograde and inversion because performers read the same score from opposite sides of a table. One performer is reading the score upside down essentially, although which side is the right way up isn't really there isn't really an upside down. You've just got a score, two people at a table, and they're reading the score from opposite sides of that table. Next type of canon, mirror canon. Yes, there are also mirror canons. Mirror canons typically involve imitation in inversion, but they can also involve imitation in retrograde and in retrograde inversion. Voices usually begin together, and mirror canon passages are palindromic in nature. So if you've watched my Messian lecture, which I'll provide a link to. I do talk about palindromes, palindromic rhythms. Okay, the next type of canon. Be careful how you pronounce this one. It's called a prolation canon, which is fine. This is also called a mensuration canon. Be careful how you spell it. Autocorrect exists, you get the idea. So in a prolation canon, each part is essentially in a different tempo. The imitative voice gives out the exact same melody, but in a different tempo. It could be in longer notes than the initial subject. So you could say this is an augmented version of the melody. Likewise, there are prolation canons in which it gives out the melody in shorter notes or by diminution. Now, if you look at the example here, you can see that each part is essentially the same melody, just written out at a different tempo. For example, you can see that the second voice is an augmentation of the first voice. Okay, so you would have your initial subject line, your melody, whatever. Then this would be imitated simultaneously in another part, but say every one of those notes has been augmented, so they've been doubled. So a crotchet has become a minim, a quaver has become a crotchet, and so on. And then these parts would be played simultaneously and you get this really nice, very suspension-y sort of effect. Listen to this piece if you get a chance. That's not all when it comes to canons though, we also have the puzzle canon. Yes, there are puzzle canons. In the Merriam-Webster dictionary, this is defined as a musical canon in which only one voice is notated and the rules for determining the remaining parts and the time intervals of their entrances must be guessed. Called also enigma canon, enigmatical canon, enigmatic canon and riddle canon. If you look at the example here, this is a puzzle canon from Bach's musical offering. You'll notice from the clefs <laughs> that it can also be played upside down. So basically, yeah, just canon, I think it's there just to have a bit of fun with. Have fun, create a riddle. Now let's have a look at Bach's Goldberg Variations, a very famous piece of music which involves canon. Bach's early biographer, Forkel, claims that this work was written for Bach's insomniac patron, Count Kieserlink at Dresden, who wanted something soothing and cheerful for his harpsichordist, Johann Gottlieb Goldberg, to play to him during his sleepless nights. Although there are other accounts out there who claim that this was for Kieserlink's daughter to play, this is unlikely given the technical difficulty of the variations, unless she was very technically apt. Regardless of the context for a moment, the work consists of 30 variations, arranged in groups of three, and every third variation is a canon. The first canon, which is the third variation, is at the unison. A canon with a unison interval. The second canon, which is the sixth variation in the whole collection of music, is at the second interval. So it's an imitation with an interval of a second. The third canon, which is variation nine, out of the whole collection of pieces in the Goldberg Variations, 
is a canon in the third interval, so it's imitating a third apart. Then the next one is like the fourth, and so on. So Bach does this nine times, each canon having an independent bass part. Interestingly, canons four and five are also inverted canons. The thirtieth variation, rather than being the expected canon of the tenth, tenth interval, is instead an ingenious chord libet, effectively a free-for-all. Quad libet literally means what pleases in Latin. In the Bach, it is a melange of popular tunes and original material permeated by the phrase Kraut und Rücken haben mich vertrieben. Which basically means cabbages and turnips have turned me away. In the Goldberg variations, as Malcolm Boyd points out, Bach elevates the position of canonic writing in composition to a level of importance at which it remains for the rest of his career. It permeates all his work until the end of his life in 1750. Right now, canons in 20th century music. Believe it or not, it wasn't just Bach or even composers of the Baroque era who employed canon in their music writing. In more recent times, composers have maintained a fascination with writing in canon. And these include serialists like Luigi Nono to minimalists like Steve Reich. And some other composers include Max Reger, Bella Bartok and Paul Hindemith. Canonic writing techniques became most popular in serialism, and in fact they formed the basic principle of serialism. You'll be familiar with terms such as retrograde inversion, retrograde inversion, as being serialistic. But as I've already mentioned, these features were part of canonic writing in the Baroque era. However, that's not to say that music of the 20th century did not develop these techniques. They did develop the canonic techniques by applying these canonic techniques to other musical parameters. In other words, composers did not just apply these to pitch, but they applied these canonic techniques to rhythm and timbre. What else have we got? Rhythm, timbre, articulation. I mentioned parameters in my last lecture on Messian as well, if you want to go back and refresh your memory of that, refresh your mind of all those parameters. Actually, in some cases, these canons are more like isorhythms. Again, remember last lecture I talked about isorhythms, just look back to that Messian lecture. And there was an increasing abstraction from Schoenberg's music to Weber's. For instance, in Schoenberg's music, the canon features in a more obvious way. In Weber's music, it's a little less obvious, even though Weber's application of canon is no less canonic. It's just more abstract. Messian is another composer who demonstrated an interest in canonic technique. In fact, he devised his own rhythmic canon. This focuses on rhythmic imitation, not pitch. And actually it closely resembles the perpetual canon in the sense that each part imitates at a predetermined and unchanging temporal distance. However, in a rhythmic canon, the pitches in each part are not the same. Only the rhythms are. Messian employed rhythmic canon in the piano part of his Trois Petites Liturgies de la Présence Divine, if you want to listen to that. We can also say that some compositional techniques of the minimalists are canonic, in particular phasing. Now, phasing is a type of canonic technique because it is based on imitation between different parts and generating patterns. These are key words to remember. Imitation, patterns, remember them. Essentially, phasing is when two or more voices play the same musical line with varying tempos. The musical lines shift in and out of phase with each other as time passes. Obvious comparison can be drawn between this and the prolation canon. The, the prolation canon being the same line played at different speeds in different parts as I've already mentioned. However, with phasing, the temporal distance between the parts is continuously changing. You could also compare this to isorhythm in that it involves two parts moving out and back into phase. This will require some deep thinking on your own part, just to let that sink in. If you want a, a musical example, Steve Reich employed phasing in his Come Out in 1966, his piano phase in 1967, and his famous clapping music in 1972, and I believe you can find good examples of this clapping music on YouTube. It's very easy to play, so have a go. Why not? Now, Anton Webern, Symphony Opus 21, composed in 1928. A composer with an excellent death, accidentally shot I think, who was a conductor, a composer and a student of Schoenberg. Along with Berg and his teacher, 
he formed the second Viennese school. Now let's have a look at Symphony Opus 21. In this piece of music there is a sparsity of material and a concentration on specific individual sounds coupled with an astonishing imagination for orchestration. There's one thing you learn about Weber, it's that he knows how to orchestrate. Weber uses the pre-compositional material the 12 tone row to make tonbral connections. The variations in Weber's Symphony Opus 21 demonstrate an interest in mirror canons. They contain a series of palindromic sections, wherein the second half of each section is a retrograde of the first half. Weber uses dodecaphonic and canonic procedures to organise and play on the imitation built into the material which consists of 12 tone row. This way he amplifies patterns inherent to the material and all this happens within a structure described as a symphony. In other words, a sonata form is played out in relation to canonic procedure. This represents Weber's fascination with formal structures. So let's have a look at Weber's Symphony Opus 21 and its constituent compositional material. Its constituent material consists of a tone row that is developed with canonic procedures. For instance, the tone row here can be described as an interval palindrome. That means that the intervals are the same forwards as they are backwards. And the whole series of intervals in this phrase is non-retrogradable. It's palindromic. It's the same forwards as it is backwards. We all know what a palindrome is. So now let's have a look at developing tone row with canonic procedures. Weber develops his tone row using canonic procedures, that is, inversion, retrograde, and inversion, retrograde. Weber transposes the pitches in the retrograde version, but the intervals are generally the same. This demonstrates how canonic procedures can be applied to abstract musical parameters, that is, intervals themselves, not just pitch. He's focusing on the intervals as a compositional parameter to work these canonic techniques on. And also by transposing the canonic imitations, by changing the pitches, keeping the intervals, he's generated further patterns. For instance, the same pitches coincide with each other throughout the versions. To put it simply, Weber is modifying his patterns to generate other patterns. Or he is generating other patterns by way of modifying patterns. Mirror Cannon. Here is an example of a mirror canon in Weber's symphony. The mirror canon is on the E natural. So basically the second half is a retrograde of the first half. As an additional note, there are palindromic phrases throughout. I've highlighted one here. So basically there are palindromes within larger palindromes. Let's have a look at Luigi Nono now. So another composer who used mirror canon technique in his music is Luigi Nono. He's described as one of the young radicals of 50s serial music and he's one who followed and developed Weber's aesthetic and techniques. He was very much intrigued by the possibilities of canon and he created intricate adaptations of the technique in works such as Canti per Tradice in 1955. Here mirror canons like the one in Weber's symphony are developed to such an extent that when the notes recur in the secondary mirror image section, they are placed up or down one or two or more octaves and may appear in different instruments to their first appearance in the initial section. You'd have one section and the whole other section would be a mirror canon of that section. You may have a subject melody in, say, the piccolo part, and then when it is mirrored in the next section, that same bit that is mirrored will happen in the double bass part octaves below and you won't really hear it you won't really hear it but there will be some underlying coherence to it and you won't quite know why this is happening all over by the way it's not like just just one piccolo part and one double bass part there's so many different instrumental parts and all these things are happening all over have a listen listen to canti per tradici by nono now i've talked about canons i've talked about patterns and i've talked about imitation in canons Nono is big on the patterns, Verben's big on the patterns, imitation is a big part of canon. The most important thing to consider when you come to writing your own canons, if you use it in your own music, 
is how does the cannon function? Why are you using a cannon? As an example, let's have a look at the work of Michael Spencer. He uses cannon in his Uber die Grenzen des Alpes and La Mer Ali avec le Soleil. He's British, by the way. In these two pieces, the cannon functions to create a starting point, one that quickly dissipates into quite different material. So in this instance, he uses cannons to generate material that he then composes with. So you might want to do that. It's great for getting over writer's block. Now, these cannons in his music are not rhythmically regulated cannons like the older examples, though a certain sense of regulated stasis is provided in La Mer Ali avec le Soleil in the bowed percussion part. It's worth listening to his music. It's available on SoundCloud online. The final example comes from the piece Toxic Knuckle Bones. Here the cannon functions differently. It is designed as a bridge passage to go from one section to another and is purely textural. So you can create a cannon to generate a certain sort of texture that's different from other parts of the music and it may work as a very useful bridge section between two parts of the music for instance. Basically when you come to use your cannon why are you using it? Are you, you don't want to merely copy composers before you want to be composers. Why? What is the function of this material you are using? Okay, another example of function here. Another recent example of how canon can function differently in a work would be James Dillon's Vernal Showers, where the opening canon sets up expectations of a Baroque-like texture. It is marked like a viol consort. The piece initially fragments and then introduces instruments that are quite unrelated to the sound world of viols. The idea that a technical feature such as the cannon can function differently in different situations is extremely important here. Let's have another look at another composer, Bryn Harrison. Now there are some quotes here about this piece. What they're saying is basically Bryn Harrison uses canonic techniques to create these patterns that you kind of hear but you can't quite pinpoint as being canonic. So this contrasts with Bach's obviously canonical music. You can hear the cannon there, you can hear it imitating. Bryn Harrison likes to make them sound, he almost likes to bring out the pattern in the music, like Nono, almost. Different style of music, but there's a similar principle going on there. I've got an example here, the Riley paintings here explain what's going on in the music on a level that you can't quite hear. There are these patterns, it seems to be unified in some way, even though each individual part is doing its own different thing, and at the same time it seems quite busy. But it's not. It's unified. It's both simultaneously unified and busy. And if you're interested in creating a sense of stasis, I do talk about this a lot in my Messian lecture. I'm not going to say that this is a foolproof way of creating stasis, but it's a way of going about doing that. You will have to play around a bit more though. So my point is with the Riley painting, you can't hear the patterns in the music like you can see them in the painting. But this is just a way of demonstrating what's going on in the painting. And yes, Bryn Harrison is supposed to be inspired by these paintings. So three key terms with canon imitation patterns function and now for a summary and conclusion okay to summarize canons have been used throughout history to generate a variety of different musical styles what i mean by that is you have medieval music you have bach and his baroque music you have serialism then we've got more modern avant-garde music, such as the music of Bryn Harrison, Michael Spencer, James Dillon. Basically, a canon is a rule. It is a rule for the composer to follow, or break, or develop. Are they going to use it to start a material and break the rules? Are they going to just imitate the intervals? Are they going to use it to create some other isorhythms and stasis and whatever? Canons formulate musical imitation and patterns that can be applied to a variety of musical parameters. So don't restrict yourself to pitch. You can manipulate any musical parameter with these techniques. How a canon functions within a musical composition is the most important thing to consider. For instance, are they using it as starting material? Are they using it as a bridge? It can be used as micro and macro level structural devices such as a bridge passage between two sections or as in whole sections such as in Luigi Nono's music. They can be used to generate particular textures where you can't quite hear specifically what's going on but there is some sort of coherence there, there is a pattern there, the texture is created by these different canons that you get going in different ways applied to different parameters of the music. They can also be used as a means for generating material if you've got writer's block or you just need that starting point. So my point is that you can take the principle of a canon as it has been used throughout history and develop it to write the music that you want to write. Bye!